Hello friends, welcome to Science Talk. I am your host and resident oceanographer, Jim Massa. Well, as you can see here from this first slide, I'm gonna to bring to you an ocean heat content update as of January, 2022. Now I'm featuring a paper here and I'm gonna to get to that in a moment. Another record, ocean warming continues through 2021 despite La Nina conditions. Usually with La Nina conditions, we have cooler conditions. El Nino, we have warmer conditions. So the ocean warming is continuing even though we supposedly are having cooler conditions in the uh, Eastern Pacific. Okay, so, this is the paper that's going to be featured here. Li Jing Chang et al. This paper appears in Advances in Atmospheric Sciences, just published this month. Here is the, uh, I will leave the URL link in, in the comments section, but here's the URL link to access the full paper. So what's the abstract here? The increased concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere from human activities traps heat within the climate system and increases ocean heat content, OHC. Here we provide the first analysis of recent OHC changes through 2021 from two international groups. The world ocean in 2021 was the hottest, hottest ever recorded by humans and the 2021 annual uh, ocean heat content value is even higher than last year's record value by 14 plus or minus 11 zeta joules. So in other words, 2020 was a record setting year and 2021 was even hotter than the record setting year of 2020. And one zeta joule is 10 to the 21 joules. You might recall, I went through all the prefixes in my original ocean heat content uh, video that I did some six, seven months ago. So the, they use the IAP in a CAS uh, uh, data set and by 16 plus or minus 10 zeta joules using the NCEI NOAA data set. The long-term ocean warming is larger in the Atlantic and Southern Ocean than in other regions and is mainly distributed, uh, mainly, excuse me, mainly attributed via climate model simulations to an increase in anthropogenic greenhouse gas concentrations. The year-to-year -year variation of OHC is primarily tied to ENSO in the seven uh, mar maritime domains of the Indian Tropical Atlantic, North Atlantic, Northwest Pacific, North Pacific, Southern Oceans, and Mediterranean uh, Sea. Robust warming is observed, but with distinct interannual to decadal variability. Basically, uh, referring to what AMO might be doing, the NAO, uh, the IPO, the IOD, the PDO, so forth. Four out of seven domains showed record high heat content in 2021. The anomalous global and regional ocean warming established in this study should be incorporated into climate risk assessments, ad ad adaptations, and mitigation. Ooh, nice little poke at IPCC for kind of skimming over oceanic effects in their reports. <laughs> but he's right. Okay. In the past 60 years, the ocean heat content has increased by approximately 3.8 times 10 to the 23rd joules. Zero to 2,000 meter average temperature has increased by 0 0.13 degrees Celsius. This is average for the 200 meter water column. Most of this inputted heat, about 68% of it, has been absorbed in the upper five to 700 meters and show dramatic increase in temperature. Remember that the oceans have absorbed 93% of all heat and CO2 emissions. This is leading to stratification of the ocean which is inhibiting sequestration of heat and CO2 to depth, as well as increased ocean acidification, which has major implications for the survival of organisms. 
Stratification has severe implications for overall oceanic productivity. And remember the role of specific heat. It takes much more energy to heat up the same volume of water than it does the same volume of air. So this is uh, my little summation here, and I referenced my previous ocean heat content video. Okay, so just a little further information, some of the summation from my prior video. So now let's look at what the data tells us. So we have the ocean heat con. This is anomalies in zeta joules. Okay. So this is how much warmer, how much cooler, according to the baseline of 81 to 2010. Okay. So as you can see, so 81 is about here. So the oceans before that were cooler when we look at from 81 to 2010 to over here which, as I explained in my prior video, if you were to compute this area and compute this area to 2010 and do an algebraic addition of it, it should be approximately zero. In other words, they counteract each other. And then we see this warming here. Now, I put this arrow in here, and uh, I'm going to leave you wondering what this is. I'm going to return to this in a bit. This is, in my view, an extremely important location in time. Okay, so let's move on. Follow the recent video I made where I discussed how deep ocean cooling may have offset global warming until around 1990. Take a look at the graph that I just showed you. What do you see starting at approximately 1995? Aha, that's where I put this arrow here. Right? We've seen what? We're seeing the ocean really starting to heat up. Okay. This is when the oceans start warming anomalously. That is above baseline averages. They've been absorbing our emissions and warming since 71, but, okay, and I a little reminder about the specific heat content of water being much higher than air. Okay. This is, that arrow, this arrow is the transition in my view. There it is for us to see where oceans can no longer sequester as effectively all the heat energy input to depth. So this is my hypothesis, my conjecture. I hypothesize that this is the start of when we really start to see the exponentiation of the numerous parameters we are now having data for. You want to talk about tipping point? There it is, folks. In my view, this is the tipping point for the climate. When the oceans are no longer able to sequester effectively all the heat to depth, this starts coinciding, as we, as we now know, measuring later on, starting in the, uh, the late OOs into the, uh, into the tens, that uh, the AMOC is slowing down, the conveyor belt is slowing down, the thermal haline flow is slowing down, further limiting, further reducing the heat and carbon sequestration to depth. And what happens after? We see you know, the ocean heat is really rising. We know that what? Temperatures are increasing. Methane thawing is increasing, right? We, we see all this. We see the CO2 levels increase, and they're all increasing exponentially. I submit to you that this right here, that arrow, that's the start of the exponentiation that we are now seeing all the parameters. This is the tipping point. This is what's made it too late for us to really reverse the effects of what we have done to our planet. So you want to ask me when the tipping point occurred? To me, this is the tipping point right there. Yes, I talked about ocean tipping points and all and, and uh, interactions among tipping points. This is the tipping point in my view for the planet.
and taken collectively. And they talk about the record heat in 2021, despite La Nina conditions. And the most recent report, 23 researchers, 14 institutes, publishing advances in atmospheric sciences. So, so there it is. That is, in my view, where it became too late for humans and too late, basically, to prevent a, a mass extinction event. That's my hypothesis. Now, detrended ocean heat content change from 0 to 2,000 meters. Okay. So they have the ONI index. The ONI is the Oceanic Nino uh, Index. It's a rolling three-month average of temperature anomalies, differences from average SSTC surface temperature. Blue is La Nina, red is El Nino. The world ocean in 2021 was the hottest, hottest ever recorded by humans, and the 2021 annual OHC value is even higher than last year's record by 14 plus or minus 11 zeta joules using the IAPCAS data set and 16 plus or minus 10 zeta joules using NCEI NOAA data set. So basically, as I re reported and, and uh, mentioned to you in my first uh, ocean heat content video, it was about 200 zeta joules. This is now up to about 240 zeta joules that the oceans have absorbed, you know, down to 2,000 meters. So that first video was, what, six, seven months ago? So in six, seven months, we've added, what, 200 to 240? That's basically a 20% increase in six months. Now think about how much energy, how much burning of fossil fuels we did to cr create that result. Think of that. And as you can see from here, we can see where we have a uh, strong uh, El Nino, strong La Ninas, and so on. And you know, these the various lines are the, uh, the ocean heat content. And you can see how much has been absorbed. Just incredible. I mean, all this energy in such a short time, we've increased the heat content in the ocean by 20%. That's mind blowing in my view. And yeah, no wonder conveyor belt, you know, the thermal hailing flows are slowing. No wonder we're starting to see really severe oceanic stratifications. All right, so I'm gonna give you a description for the next slide uh, that we see. The long-term ocean warming is larger in the Atlantic and Southern Ocean comparing the spatial Ocean heat content anomalies in 2021 versus 2020 shows an imprint of La Nina. The NCEI NOAA data shows a consistent spatial pattern compared with IAPCAS. And they use 10 to the 9 joules, which is 1 gigajoule. So NCEI is National Centers for Environmental Information. IAPCAS is Institute of Atmospheric Physics, Chinese Academy of Sciences. So that's what, and of course, NOAA and National Oceanic or Atmospheric Administration. So uh, that's what these uh, uh, acronyms uh, stand for. Okay, so let's take a look at that slide. So in the top one here, okay, that's the ocean heat anomaly, 0 to 2,000 meters, relative to the 81 to 2010 baseline. Now, as you can see here, this is what they talk about, the, the Atlantic and the Southern Oceans is where a lot of the the warming is, is was greatest. We see the greater anomaly. Here is the La Nina signal right there coming through. Okay, so we so we can see that where it's white basically means that there is no departure in the average values from the uh, the baseline. Okay, and there's your units to uh, you know gigajoules per square meter, and then you can see by how much. Okay. So basically, this would be like four times 10 to the nine joules per square meter or four gigajoules. You know, that's, that's an incredible amount of heat. Now, there's something else I wish to point out to you in looking at this slide. You notice how it's darker on the Western Atlantic 
on the western southern Atlantic and the western northern Pacific. And in this little band right here, what is going on there? Well, in all of these three laws, I'll talk about this here at last, but in the North Atlantic, the South Atlantic, North Pacific, this is showing you where the gyres are. This, this is basically where the Gulf Stream is. You have Western intensification with gyres because, you know, you, you, the gyres are trying to balance the pressure gradient of the Coriolis effect, wind stress. They're trying to balance all this so that the result is that currents on the Western side of the gyre are stronger. They flow faster, they're narrower, and they go deeper. By the time you, you come over to the Eastern side, it uh, slows down, it's not as deep and it's wider. So, so it's going to be really concentrating. So we see the heat build up over here and over here for the same uh, reasons. Not as strong uh, because the Oyashio current is not as strong as the Gulf Stream uh, current. But what's going on here? That is pretty much the location of the intertropical convergence zone. So you're converging the, you know, the water mass and the water heat there. Because basically what you have is you have the, uh, as you can see, the, the equator is right there. So you have the southern equatorial current. You have the northern equatorial current. Then you have the equatorial counter current that kind of sits right on zero degrees. Now the equatorial uh, counter current is a, a west to east flowing current. The northern and southern equatorial currents are east to west flowing. But basically, and this is, and this moves around, this inter, uh, uh, tropical convergence zone, ITZZ, this moves around. It can be here, here, whatever. It moves around, shifting back and forth. But that's kind of showing where the ITCZ is. So we can see, you know, compared to this 30-year baseline, how much warmer the oceans have gotten. That is a lot of heat, you know, specific heat and all that. Now, in the next two slides here, or next two panels of this slide, they're going to compare 2021 to 2020. This middle one here is the IAPCAS data, right? Chinese Academy of Sciences. The bottom one here is the uh, NCEI data. We still, we overall, we see similar results. Right? We can see the La Nina signal, right? You can see it there, 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 right? So we see the La Nina signal. We see the ICT, uh, the ITCZ there, there, and there. Okay. What is showing is that certain spots of the ocean were warmer compared to 2020. Other spots were cooler compared to 2020. We see overall, this is why they're making the statement that overall the North Atlantic and the Southern Oceans were warmer from 20, you know, 2021 was warmer than 2020. The NCEI data is able to sh you know, show little minute differences than the IAP CAS uh, data does. So we can see a little more of the nuance in the data. But overall, we can see how much warmer 2021 was for the oceans compared to just a year before in 2020. And of course, like anything else, folks, with, you know, I, pu I put these videos together. You know, as you're viewing this, you can always pause the video if you wish to scrutinize whatever it is uh, I'm showing you know, for your own further elucidations. So, you know, feel free to do that. All right, I'm going to give you a description what we're going to view next. The drivers of observed ocean heat content trend pattern from 79 to 2020. So basically that's a 40 year uh, uh, examination. The warming pattern is mainly attributed to increased anthropogenic greenhouse gas concentrations offset by the impact of aerosols. So I want to give a you know, a quick shout out to uh, Guy McPherson, who uh, was very helpful and generous of his time in uh, sharing with me important peer-reviewed uh, articles from spanning a number of years 
that has helped me increase my and, and improve my understanding of aerosol. And I'm an oceanographer. Don't really deal, didn't really deal too much with atmospheric stuff other than high and low pressure systems, you know, wind directions. So uh, uh, he has helped me improve my understanding of aerosols, and I just want to convey my appreciations uh, for that. So here's the key in what we're going to be seeing in the, uh, the panels that uh, I'm going to be sharing with you. So these are all deltas. So delta XAER is the change in aerosols. XBMB is the change in the biomass burn, you know, like burning down forests, burning grasslands. And uh, GHG, right, change in greenhouse gases. And then uh, XLULC, change in land use, land cover. Kind of tied in also with biomass burn. So uh, let's take a look. So again, we're going to uh, look at the, so the top one here, okay. So this is the overall trend for the past 40 years from zero to 2,000 meters. And as you can see, the overall trend, North Atlantic and the Southern Oceans are really, really much, much more warmer. Most of the oceans are much are, are warmer. Right? Oh, look at that little blue spot there. Yeah, that's the Gen C. That's all this cold uh, ice melt coming off of Greenland and some currents from Labrador Brain. That's the cool spot. This is historically where uh, the conveyor belt begins. Okay. But, and we can see the Arctic Ocean is warmer, right? Pacific Ocean is warmer, but the greatest warming, as they stated in the abstract, the Southern Ocean and the North Atlantic. And we can clearly see it here. And then they, they just show you a standard deviation. Now here's the change in aerosol. So with a few exceptions, like, you know, up here, like in the Barents Sea location, or uh, looks like off of, like, near Nova Scotia, something like that. What do we see here? Well, let's look at our, our scaling here. That looks like it's about minus 0.4 to minus 0.8, that uh, range there. In other words, the aerosol effect is to cool down because the aerosol cools down the atmosphere that will then reduce how much heat the oceans absorb. So in other words, if were it not for this aerosol effect, the warming would be even greater in the ocean, just as the warming would be greater in the atmosphere. That's what this is telling us. Now, burning of uh, the biomass burning. Well, when you burn biomass, you're putting basically soot into the atmosphere. So that soot is also a form of aerosol, but this is more from human activity. Okay? This aerosol is, is uh, from the burning of the fossil fuel with the fine, very fine particulate amount of uh, burning of biomass is probably coarser particulate matter. So that's why it's not as widespread, the cooling effect. But again, we see a cooling effect of in the minus 0.4 to minus 0.8 range. So again, to drive home this point, the introduction of aerosols, soot, and so forth, serves to cool the atmosphere, offset the warming slightly, but that then results in the ocean because the atmosphere is now a little uh, cooler, the heat absorbed by the ocean will be slightly less as well. So again, were it not for the aerosols, were it not for the soot, atmospheric and oceanic temperatures would be considerably warmer. And then this one here is the change in greenhouse gases. And you can see how this graphic pretty much is just like this first graphic here. And the change in the land use and land cover really overall doesn't have too much of a, an impact on uh, ocean heat content. We see the impact from uh, aerosols and soot in the atmosphere in, in cooling down uh, the ocean heat. And we can see that the main driver, of course, is greenhouse gases. So that's 
That's what this graphic is showing. It's showing that greenhouse gas is driving the ocean, the increased ocean heat content that is slightly, ever so slightly modif modified, moderated by aerosols. That's what this is showing. Okay, now for the next slide. More than 20 years continuous observations in the Mediterranean Sea at the Sicily Channel shows a dramatic warming of the Mediterranean Sea. The intermediate waters, 150 to 450 meters, indicates a steep increase between 2014 and 2017 and a linear trend of 0 0.028 degrees C per year overall from 99 to 21. Now, when we look at this, I want you to also look at the years from about 2012 to 2017. We see temperatures increase from approximately 13.85 C to about 14.5 C. This is roughly speaking, an approximately 0 0.13 C per year increase, which is incredible. I will get to this red bit in a moment. Let's take a look at it. So here's the temperature anomalies from 99 to 2021. And they give you dates like December 99 and so on. And they give you know dates of the year. So this is the temperature anomalies overall. Then the temperatures and anomalies from 99 to 2021 when compared to the baseline of 81 to 2010. And you can see that it's getting warmer and warmer. And this is a change in temperature in degrees C. Right? Now, this could be a uh, riverine input of water that's a little cool, you know, maybe draining the uh, Alps or something like that. So it could be like mountain water, you know, that cools the surface temperature. But overall, you know, just as the description said, the intermediate waters are really indicates a steep increase between 2014 and 2017. And there it is. We see it right here is a steep increase, really heating up. Then they plot it. So this kind of gives you like uh, zonal aspects. Zonal is like, a, this is a time series aspect with depth, okay? Cross time, down in depth. And then they start taking the data and they start plotting. So they take the average temperature from 150 to 450 meters. So that's from here to here, right? There's that band with that warmth. So they plot the average temperature by year. They got all these points here. The dashed line is the regression line. The slope of that regression line is the 0 0.028 degrees C per year from 99 to 2021. So that's this here. Now what I am saying is what I find interesting is if you look from about 2012 here, 2017, look at these series of data point. Look, notice how I'm moving the cursor. Look at that line there. You know, if you, were to, if you were just consider only these data points and you fit a regression line through here, right? Just as I'm moving that cursor, you're going to see about a 0 0.13 C per year increase. Right? We see this, right? 13.85 or so to about 14.5 or so. This simply shows you the stations where they were uh, get collecting the data. And that shows you like transects and so forth. Well, we see a sharp increase for temperatures in the years I indicated. Now, why is this important? Why do I bring this to your attention? Waters that exit the Mediterranean become the North Atlantic Intermediate Water, NAIW. It is this water that flows towards the Fram Strait. Basically, it exits out Gibraltar, Coriolis deflects it to the right, and kind of aims it right at the Fram Strait. So it is this water that goes into the Fram Strait, enters the Arctic Ocean, bringing in all that extra heat energy that impacts the sea ice, or the lack thereof of sea ice in the Arctic Ocean. So when we see this incredible warming in the Mediterranean, that is going to end up in the Arctic Ocean. The Gulf Stream 
is a, you know, goes from about zero to 700, maybe 1,000 meters or so. But that's the approximate depth that it reaches. And yeah, surface water, you know, it flows into the Gin Sea. Typically in the path, it would cool and sink. And it would sink down to about 1,500 to 2,000 meters, which is the North Atlantic deep water flowing south. What's in between? What's in between that, you know, 700 to 1,500 meters or so? What have you? That's, it's this water here. It's this intermediate water whose source water is the Mediterranean. So if it flows out, it deepens because, you know, the Mediterranean isn't as deep as the Atlantic. And it's bringing in this warm, and the Mediterranean has high salinity values. So it's bringing in this warm, so it's warm waters, but it's high salinity. So the density is such that it sits in between the surface waters of the Atlantic, which basically the Gulf Stream, and the deep water. So that's why you can have, even though it's warm water, but it's very salty water, that's why you have this warm, salty water that can move into the Arctic Ocean. And then that heat does diffuse upward, melts the ice, or keeps the ice, keeps the water from freezing to form ice. That's why that's important. So even if AMOX slows or stops, you're still going to have this North Atlantic intermediate water that comes out of the Mediterranean and it's going to still flow into the Arctic Ocean. Which is why, you know, most people say, well, you know, AMOX slows down, it promotes ice growth, you know, sea ice growth and so on. It may in certain areas, but as long as you have this very, this in increasing warm water, right? Increasing warm water. We see it right here in the graph. You're going to keep bringing that heat into the Arctic Ocean. You're going to keep it uh, ice-free uh, for longer, or at least re uh, reduce the ice extent. That'd be a better way to put it. You're going to reduce the ice extent for longer, which means it allows that would allow for more sun energy to be absorbed by the ocean, as well as the increased heat energy being brought in from the oceans. Oceans are warming, and that heat is going ends up into the Arctic Ocean. And definitely in the north, in the in a high latitude ocean, as we see here and here. And look at all that warming ocean up there, right? Here's come here's the Mediterranean coming out and does this Coriolis benders and it goes right there. So this is probably a reflection of not only the overall warming of the ocean, but maybe a little heat diffusion, heat flux, if you will. Mediterranean and then it goes into the Arctic Ocean and what we see over here is that you know as it swings around you know, it flows around the Eurasian side and comes in to me this is important information that's why I include it here and this is what and why it's important that's the importance okay the seven maritime domains of the Indian Tropical Atlantic, North Atlantic, Northwest Pacific, North Pacific, Southern Ocean, the Mediterranean Sea. Robust warming is observed, but with distinct interannual to decadal variability. Four of the seven domains showed record high ocean heat content in 2021. Take a look. So here are the oceans, and each of these boxes refers to one of these panels over here that surround the central pattern. So, we'll, hey, why not start at the top? So, A is the Northwest Pacific. That's right in this vicinity here. And gives you by decades. Again, this is the, uh, you know, the, the anomalies, the differences. 10 to the 9th, this would be uh, joules. So, these are gigajoules here. And we see the Northwest Pacific almost looks like a cube root function, but uh, we can see a lot of variation. That's the variation they're talking about from decadal and interannual variation. And overall trend, it almost looks like it's been flatlining, maybe a slight decrease in the last, uh, you know, since the start of the century. So not much happening in this region of the ocean. B is the uh, Indian Ocean. That's this 
square here. And we look at this here. Again, we see the interannual variability. And then starting with 2000, we see a clear overall increase in the heat being absorbed. Again, juxtaposed upon the interannual variability. Okay, C is the tropical Atlantic. That's basically the Caribbean, you know, this vicinity here, Sagasso C, etc. And we clearly see, even starting as in early 1960, it just it's just warming. And of course, the, the horizontal is the bait is you know zero. So below the dash line, it's cooler. Above the dash line, it's warmer. And so we we see in the Indian Ocean, tropical Atlantic, clearly a warming trend. Come to the Mediterranean, and as I just showed you, uh, we also see a clear indication of warming. E is the North Atlantic, which is this outlined by this purple, magenta color, whatever it is, but it's this region here. That's the North Atlantic. And again, we start seeing a clear warming trend. And in the North Pacific, that's finally, that's this there. We also see a clear warming trend starting at about late 1990s. So the gray that you see is the monthly, the black is the smooth, and then the gray shading is the 95% confidence interval, which we see a lot of here and here. Notice that in the, in the years dating back to like 1960, the confidence intervals are wider. Why is that? Well, the instrumentations, the recordings weren't as accurate. So there's a lot more error. So when you have a higher error, you're going to have a higher confidence uh, interval because that means that 95% of the time, the actual value is in this interval. So, you know, larger errors, standard errors, what have you, will lead to a wider confidence interval, meaning that we have a wider range for where we would find the true value 95 times out of 100. So as you improve the measurements, improve the sophistication of the instrument, all that reduce the error, you do what? You increase the accuracy because you're reducing the confidence interval so that you're pretty much narrowing in what the actual values are. Now, where do we start, you know, let's look at the North Pacific. Where do we start seeing this increase in the heat content? Ooh, about 1995. North Atlantic, where do we start seeing where it starts to really turn upwards? About 1995. About the Mediterranean Sea? About 1995. What about the tropical Atlantic? It was increasing all along, but where does it start getting into the positive realm? About 1995. A little later in the Indian Ocean, but still, we start seeing the upturn about 1995. You know, maybe a little lag to when it's, the value start becoming on the positive side. But in, in these ones that I just pointed out, include, and also the Southern Ocean, 1995. That correlates to this right here. If there's any key point you want to take out of this video, 1995 is when the oceans no longer able to sequester heat to depth. So therefore, the surface layers start really warming up. And because it's warming up, the ability to absorb heat cannot keep pace. That's leading to an increase in atmospheric temperature so that the, the temperatures are starting to exponentiate. And if you're not reducing the heat, you're also not reducing the CO2. So the CO2 levels are starting to exponentiate. And we could get to the point where ocean saturation is reached, where the CO2 could start outgassing back to the atmosphere from the oceans.
seeing all this data and putting it all together, that's when I came to the realization that this was the, the tipping point of tipping points for the planet and the climate. That's my hypothesis. You know, people want to debate it, debate it. Go for it. All the oceans, no matter whether there's an increasing trend or not, all the oceans from starting with 2000 are, uh, are showing more heat content compared to the baseline than prior. Oceans heating up and think of the specific heat, all that heat energy. This is, this is a very troubling, incredible uh, data and findings here as well. Now, I really like this next slide because when you see it, you'd be able to picture basically all these heat blobs in the oceans and all and how the oceans have absorbed all this heat for the past 50 years. The increases in ocean heat content have direct implications for the frequency, intensity of marine heat waves or MHWs and other quote unquote hotspots. Warming anomalies in 2021 relative to the 81-2010 baseline are about two degrees C near the surface and one degree C at down about 300 meters in the middle North Pacific. Now the North Pacific, okay, up here, panel F, all right, you know, we start seeing the clear increase in the heat content. Here we go. This is amazing, okay? So we have latitude here, longitude at the top. This is a 3D graph. And then we have depth on the vertical here, okay? Now take a look at this. It shows it down in some spots, down to almost 400 meters, a couple little blobs here, okay? This is the color scale. This is telling you how much warmer compared to the 81 to 2010 uh, baseline these temperatures are. These are all what we call isosurfaces. So to show the 0 0.5, the 1.0, the 1.5, the 2.0 isosurfaces. In other words, 0.5 warmer, 1, 1 degree warmer, 1.5 degree warmer, 2 degree warmer compared to the 80-81 baseline. So you can see here, you know, this is getting around, you know, 0 to 0.5 in here. We get into this more browner stuff here. That's one degree, and then this darker, I guess, rusty color, whatever, you know, 1.5 degree. And then we get into the really dark stuff, you know, two degrees. But, you know, we can see the 0. 0.5, we can see the 1, we see the 1.5, and we see the 2, right? 0. 0.5, 1, 1. 1.5, 2. That's how much, you know, and think of how much of a region we're talking about. You know, we're going from like, you know, 150 degrees east latitude to almost 180 east, excuse me, east longitude to 180 east longitude. We're going, you know, from, you know, 30 to 60 north latitude. We're going down to, you know, and, I, and I'm, I'm just looking at the two degrees uh, C increase. I'm going down to almost 400 meters. When you go from 140 east longitude all the way over to the 240 east longitude, or another way of saying 120 west longitude, okay? But think, this is the North Pacific here. The Pacific Ocean is the biggest ocean on the planet. Look, that gives you an idea how much heat. I would, they didn't uh, provide this. I would love to see similar graphs for the North Atlantic and the Southern Ocean. It would be even more startling than this. This gives you an idea. The extent of how much heat is in the ocean, how far spread it is, north, south, east, west, and down to depth. Do you know, envision this for the North Atlantic, the South Atlantic, the Southern Oceans. That's all that heat energy there. So when people say, well, we can stop the greenhouse gas emission and we can keep, you know, warming to under two, bullshit. This heat, this thermal inertia, you can't argue with thermodynamics, folks. This thermal inertia is, 
is putting the planet on a trajectory of severe warming this century alone. You know, depending on the models you look at, depending on the thermodynamic, uh, you know, flux rates and all that kind of stuff, the, the warming could be anywhere 5 to 11 C by the end of this century. There's a lot of heat here, a lot of thermal inertia, heat that will flux to the atmosphere. So this is, this is a great graphic. I just absolutely love this graphic because it, it shows it to you. Boom. Here's, here's what the oceans have absorbed. It's not just some abstract concept. There it is. There's the data. We plot it for you. Here's the energy, the excess energy in the ocean that is waiting because there's no more, because the thermal hailing flow is slowing. This heat energy is waiting to go into the atmosphere. And keep in mind, this is actually ameliorated a little bit because a branch of the conveyor belt does upwell in this vicinity of the ocean. So that might even help keep the layers down to four or 500 meters a little bit cooler. So this is not going to sink. This will not sink to death. This heat will not be sequestered to death. This heat is in these upper hundreds of meters waiting to diffuse to the atmosphere. Can't argue with physics, folks. Just can't. As I said, just envision this in the North Atlantic, Southern Ocean, Southern Atlantic. Incredible. So ocean warming has far-reaching consequences and should be incorporated into climate risk assessment, adaptation, and mitigation. Some of the impacts include, but not limited to, increasing sea levels, right? Thermal expansion, increased coastal flooding. Well, if the sea levels are, are rising, you're going to flood the coast, right? Less fishery resources decrease in biodiversity. Why is that? because you're getting stratification. You start stratifying the ocean, you're reducing primary productivity. You're also stressing the fish out. If the, if the waters are warming up around them, it's going to metabolically burn them out. So therefore they may not have energy left over into spawning. Or they simply move to a, a spot in the ocean where the temperature is more to their liking, but where's their food? Leads to a decrease in biodiversity. Bleaching of the coral reefs, that's tied into acidification. That's a major problem. You got all that heat energy, it, it does what? And it's warm. We know that uh, you know, any types of cyclonic motion, typhoons, cyclones, hurricanes, whatever, you know, they feed off the heat energy. So they're going to be stronger, more intense, travel further unleash more precipitation typically you're gonna you know you're gonna have that heat energy going into the atmosphere leading to increased you know water moisture content because warmer air can hold more moisture so you're gonna get heavier rains maybe storm surges ahead of these uh cyclones that reach land and then you know the marine heat waves are gonna get you're gonna get they're gonna be stronger and more frequent now, the figures that did show are courtesy Li Zhen Cheng. Not quite done here. I want you now to consider the following. For every one degree C of warming, heavy rain events will intensify by about 7%. You know, officially it's 1.2, more like 1.5. Why are we getting all these rain events? Why are we getting heavy snows? Why did, you know, interior Alaska in the month of December set precipitation record levels of a, well, an extremely scientific term, shitloads of snow. <laughs> yeah, we set a record for December. It's just, we got friggin' nailed. And, and, and a lot of that snow actually changed over to freezing rain and rain, then back to snow. So it just made for a bloody mess here. Okay. You know, again, I'm reiterating some of my points here, but these are important points for people to understand and realize, you know, get their minds around. Oceans have absorbed some 93% of all greenhouse gas emissions over the past 51 years, and about 68% of this is in the upper five to 700 meters. This is stratifying the ocean, leading to less heat CO2 sequestration to death. As the warming of the oceans continues, the oceans will become saturated with respect to gas solubility. 
resulting in gases dissolved in oceanic water will outgas back to the atmosphere. Heat will also diffuse to the atmosphere using the form of latent heat. Okay, that means CO2 will go back into the atmosphere. So then the oceans will no longer be able to absorb the CO2. Well, now you really start exponentiating the CO2. We might as well say the CO2 equivalent. Higher CO2 levels leads to warmer atmospheric temperatures. The now outgassing CO2 and heat will lead to, a, in my view, a runaway warming of the planet. In other words, something that could approach you know, conditions on the order of the PETM, Paleocene Eocene Thermal Max. This runaway warming will help trigger, not the only factor, i.e. temperature, other factors, a mass extinction event. I mean, think about it. That's what this, all this heat energy, that's what it's all doing. And now, I, I want, granted, it's kind of a simplistic little diagram here, but just to kind of give you an idea of the mechanisms of, you know, of the, you know, how the oceans came to absorb the heat, and then the thermal inertia, the heat flux that's going to take place. So this is supposed to represent, you know, greenhouse gas emissions from factories, uh, you know, vehicles, uh, agricultural processes, uh, cow flatulence, which is a major contributor, by the way. So this goes, you know, it gets released into the atmosphere. So you have the greenhouse gases in the lower atmosphere. The greenhouse gases radiate the heat. And then this, mo see how it says mo most of the heat is taken up by the oceans. So this dashing line that you see here is it being working its way into the ocean. You know, presumably working its way down to depth. And then, as we see here, oh, it's doing what? It's diffusing, and these up and downs is representing seasonal changes, but it's starting to do what? It eventually diffuses, it fluxes back to the atmosphere. So in other words, the greenhouse gas emissions we're putting into the atmosphere it ends, a lot of it ends up in the oceans, but ultimately it will end up right back into the atmosphere, all that heat. It will just end up right back into the atmosphere. It takes approximately 30 to 50 years for greenhouse gas emission heat to register as a temperature increase at the planet's surface. That's usually once per square meter. The ocean heat transfer continues for hundreds of years. Now, need to clarify this here a bit. This is 30 to 50 years to actually measure it at the surface. In all honesty, though, the temperatures we're measuring now, 1.2, 1.5, whatever you want to, you know, whatever view or data you want to go with, there's about a 10 to 15 year lag. So we are feeling the temperatures of, you know, the effects, today's temperature effect is the result of CO2 levels from 10 to 15 years ago. There's a lag. It's not immediate. So what we are experiencing now is from the CO2 levels 10, 15 years ago. The current CO2 levels, the effects from those, from these current levels, will not be felt until another 10, 15 years into the future. So we're talking what? 2032, 2037. There's always a bit of a lag. This thermal inertia, right? And they call it here. Climate system inertia due to the ocean heat delay or lag. The lag is the time it takes for an emission to a temperature increase registering up the surface. This thermal inertia, this heat flux, will continue for centuries. Hundreds of years. This will continue for centuries. This is why I stated that with all this ocean heat content, in my view, and you know, also, and I base this on looking at some papers where they've done the modeling on this. The planet is locked into a warming trajectory of anywhere from five to eleven C, occurring this century. That is an incredible rate of increase. 
the rate of change increase is incredible. Fast as we got data for. It didn't take, it took mil- millions of years, uh, well, actually more like hundreds, hundreds of thousands of years to get to PETM, millions of years to cool down from the PETM. We're doing this in a couple of centuries. This is a, a blink. So this is just absolutely uh, mind-boggling to think of. So as I said, this is a simplistic idea to show you the kind of a, a, a simplistic matter, the mechanism absorbing the heat from the uh, atmosphere, perhaps sequestering it, but then it ultimately, because the sequestration slows, that heat will make its way back to the atmosphere with very deleterious, adverse, drastic results impacting not just humans, but organisms. As stated before, this can help trigger a mass extinction event. So, again, 1995, thereabouts, that's your tipping point, creating the situation, creating, doing everything. Because when you come right down to it, the oceans are the actual drivers of climate, more so than the atmosphere. Atmosphere, of course, has a role. The oceans are the drivers, and we're seeing it. This, to me, is your turning point. This is your tipping point, your changeover. And now when you look at how high zetajoule content is, not good. That and uh, this shows you the effects of greenhouse gas, how aerosol can slightly mitigate it, not significantly. And this shows you your, the anomalies. This shows you how much, where the heat's been absorbed. And then the difference from year to year. And then, of course, this one shows you how much the Mediterranean has warmed up, which ends up in the Arctic Ocean. And then I just love this graphic. That's a great graphic. It lays it out for you, the extent of all this heat energy waiting to go back into the atmosphere. There you have it. This is uh, my ocean heat content update as of January 2022. Short of it is, we put put in the ocean to absorb a shitload more energy, an increase of 20%. And this is going to have grave consequences. So I hope you found this video informative. And uh, I thank you for your time. Hello folks, this is Jim here with Science Talk, asking you to please subscribe to my channel and to inform others of my channel and of the work that I do. Please share to social media platforms that you use. Also, as a reminder, don't forget to click the bell so that you know when I load up more videos. Finally, I ask that you support the work that I do by becoming a patron at patreon.com. Details in the description box below. Thank you for your support.